Asio? Present. Mrs. Evans? Here. Mrs. Fitzpatrick? Here. Mr. Healy? Here. Ms. McCurdy? Here. Mr. Morris? Here. Mrs. Paradise? Present. Vice Chairperson Mr. Hill? Here. Chairperson Mrs. Granado? Present. And Weathersfield High School Student Representative Ms. Aguilar? Present. All present. Great. So the board invites um, Highcrest students led by teachers Chris Fox and Marilee DeJohn to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Would you come on right up here? Okay, thank you, High Crest. All right, um, Mr. Emmett, we have a staff recognition tonight? We do, we do have staff student recognition. We have something going on over at High Crest Elementary School this week. So if I could please have our friends from High Crest come up to the podium and tell us what's going on. Good evening, I'm Chris Fox. I'm one of the co-chairs with the PBAS Committee. It's the Positive Behavior Intervention Support System at High Crest. Along with, Oops, sorry, Marilee D. John, and we're. Um, I have to turn. Oh, they're getting over there. We're doing a project. It's called Start with Hello. It's by the Sandy Hook Promise, and we all know um, Sandy Hook and what happened at those events. And the big thing about the organization is it's trying to help get schools involved in helping students that are feel isolated at all. And these are initiatives that take place to make schools a safe place and allow students and techniques to get everyone involved in school to make sure that there no one's excluded. And um, the whole week we'll go through our presentation, but there's an activity each day to make sure that students, there's just a little thing they can say just by start saying hello to get people involved in school. So on Monday, let me push that down for my short. On Monday, all the parents and teachers were provided with a packet that you're just receiving now. Um, explaining all the initiatives and some of the activities that you could or could not do um, for the course of the week. Chris and I selected um, just a handful of, of elect, uh, activities that we would do just so not to overwhelm all of our teachers. And um, they could extend these activities into the next coming weeks or the next month, but to get the week started, we picked ones that we thought were doable. Um, so on Tuesday, today, was No Child Plays Alone Day. So we encouraged um, staff and support staff, paraprofessionals, um, lunch aides, anybody who saw any child playing alone to make sure that they were not socially isolated um, and had somebody to play with. On um, Wednesday, tomorrow is Hay Day, and everybody in the whole school is going to be wearing a sticker um, that uh, says their name and they're encouraged to talk to somebody and say hello to somebody as they pass them in the hallway. So no heads down, everybody's saying hello. And Thursday is sticky note day and all the children are encouraged to write a sticky note, something positive, pop it on a locker, pop it on someone's book bag, pop it on someone's desk. You can um, do something nice for an adult. Um, a custodian, a friend, anybody that you think maybe needs some encouragement. And on Friday, we have our school-wide morning meeting. It's also our Dress in Green Day to honor Sandy Hook. And um, we are going to be presenting um, something you'll be seeing tonight, just tonight. Uh, and it's a clip of the children singing um, a song about smiling. And also um, a little um, saying hello. Um, from all of us on the staff and maybe a little surprise. Yes. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Okay. And then, um, this slide again, it just shows or explains what Sandy Hook does start with Hello Week, the promises to prevent social isolation. The organization envisioned school environment where everyone feels connected and included. And one step was the program they thought about it, I think it was two or three years ago, but start saying hello. This promise connects to our PBS program and our SEL curriculum that's new this year. It's again, it's a curriculum that's based on making sure that students feel welcome and are safe in our schools. And it goes in easily just by saying hello is the first start to doing that. And every 
day this week, as Mr. Um, Mrs. Ejan mentioned, we have all these activities, and there's also in the packet, you can see, I don't know which page it is, but there's probably like 10 or 15 more activities that teachers can do, like Mrs. Ejan said, throughout the year or this week as well. And there's the schedule of events this week. And this is one of the videos that we have. This is for our morning meeting at the end. Our class, is, mine's a third grade class this year, Mrs. Dijon's second grade class. We've been singing Hello to All the Children of the World. And it's a different language, and again, it also incorporates all children. So this is what we practiced the other day. It's not the final product, but yeah, so, <laughs> little clip still a work in progress. <laughs> And so that clip is part of the morning meeting, and there's other parts in the morning meeting where everyone's going to be wearing green. And then we have other grades presenting the character traits of the month, and there's 10 throughout the year that each month, like this month's cooperation, next month will change to a different one. So those students will, again, lay the groundwork for the rest of the year of the character traits that each student's going to focus on. Oops, let's see. And now here is a video clip, some clips of the start saying hello by all the staff members. We actually, I think every, maybe like two or three weren't, but most of the staff members did participate. It's very cool how it came along too, together. Fun at the end too. <laughs> teachers don't get it right. You didn't wreck your car, did you? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, unlock it. <laughs> Hello. Hello. No, I'm not. I'm not. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Three. You're missing Chris. This is yeah, it's missing. Hello. Chris. <laughs> 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 so that's going to be played at the morning meeting and um, after in the song will be after that and then we'll culminate it with our going green all day so that's our initiative this year and we hope to do it throughout the rest of the year oh thank you and we do want to thank the staff was very supportive of this we've been emailing them nonstop for ideas and um, Mrs. O'Connor greatly helped us with our PowerPoint and the video clips and she's been very supportive with any initiative that we give her too so just want to thank her as well and you guys will all be part of this <laughs> You're in, so. thank, thank you, you. anyone with any questions for them why they're up there no wonderful I'd love you to come back and tell us how I love the cards do you see the cards at the back, everyone? Icebreaker cards. Yes. Those are, they're great. And yeah. would you rather be a fish or a cow? 
And Michael, I'm going to ask you, do you want to drive an electric or a gas car? Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, thank we'll you. send you the final one. The with final one, you're in it, too. So. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you again. And next on tonight's agenda is the approval of the minutes for our regular Board of Ed meeting on September 11, 2018. Anybody see any corrections? John? Yeah, it's just a correction in um, Eden's last name. There's an I missing. You're on top of My apologies. That's good. I'll check. Her, right? <laughs> any others? All right. May I have a motion to approve these minutes? So moved. A second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Abstain. So noted. Okay, those minutes are approved. And now, if there's anyone wishing to make a public comment, come on up to our podium and state your name and address. And may I remind you that we have a five minute limit. Good evening. Hello. My name is Amy DeVoe. I live at 89 Hartford Ave. I am the president of the Paraclerical Secretarial Media Union. We all just came here tonight to let you guys know that we're here and that we work with the students every day, um, that we've been under negotiations for a long time, over a year. And we don't want you to forget that we're here working hard for the children in this town. We're looking forward to an appropriate resolution to the negotiations and getting a fair contract. So we just wanted to show our faces. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. <laughs> I know my many years in a classroom, I couldn't do it so often without a paraprofessional in my room. So I thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else for comment? Okay. Mr. Emmett, you have communication to share? I do. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Granado. Good evening, everyone. I'm pleased to report uh, that the additional section mm -hmm. of kindergarten at Hammer School is almost ready. Um, we have a candidate in place. Uh, she will be starting in this classroom next Wednesday. Uh, Ms. Greer will be in contact with parents regarding the facilitation of this process. Um, we have all of the materials that we need in place already, as we used to have three sections of K, so there's no financial impact there. Uh, this evening, Mrs. DeStoli will be providing a presentation on the district student achievement data. Um, you also see in the audience this evening uh, many of our dedicated administrators um, who do a tireless job of making sure that our kids get what they need to succeed. So they're here this evening as well. In terms of principal searches, so you know, we had uh, staff and parent focus groups for the web principalship last mm -hmm. Wednesday. Focus groups for the Silas Dean principal position will be held on Tuesday, October 2nd in the Silas Dean Media Center. The staff focus group will convene at 320, and the parent focus group will take place at 6 p.m. Uh, the facility study for the district is still in progress. The team will be visiting two schools this week. Uh, Emerson Williams will be assessed tomorrow. Webb will have its assessment on Friday. Uh, this leaves Silas Dean as the only school remaining for review. At our most recent work group meeting held last week, we are anticipating that the presentation of data and options for um, this uh, long range plan will be taking place at the Board of Ed meeting on October 23rd. And also an update on something I reported earlier, uh, the appellate court will be coming to Weathersfield High School, that date's been confirmed, uh, Tuesday, April 16th in the auditorium. Uh, certainly have more details as the uh, date draws closer. This will be a great opportunity for our students and staff to see the judicial system in action. So very interesting. With that, that's communications. Okay. Any questions for Michael? Okay. So we'll move on then. <clears throat> so tonight we have only one action item, action item 6A. And Chris, will you please read that action for us? Uh, yes, ma'am. That motion. Sure. <clears throat> I make a motion. Uh, Move that the Board of Education approve revised policy 1500 concerning smoking. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. 
Any discussion? We did have our first reading two weeks ago. Chris? Yeah, just, it just brings us into compliance. It tightens up the law to reflect state statute, and I think uh, gives people here the confidence that we will have a complete smoke-free environment um, within the borders of our respective grounds and facilities. And I would urge adoption. Mm-hmm. Anyone else? That's a question. John? Does this also cover smoking at school-sponsored activities that are off of our property, such as sports events? It, it does not. It focuses on school buildings. Uh, the statute is specific to in-school buildings. We extend it, as our previous policy stated, we extend it to the entire um, school grounds. So, for example, uh, I'm at the high school and the bus drivers are waiting to pick up students. The bus drivers want to smoke. They cannot smoke on school grounds. They have to walk up the driveway, go out to the sidewalk on public property with which to smoke. Uh, the previous policy was very clear on that. Um, our new Shipman and Goodwin policy was only focused on in buildings. Um, we think it's important to maintain a smoke-free environment. We want our kids and our uh, folks to be safe. In terms of um, school-sponsored events outside, if a student um, is a minor and is smoking or perhaps vaping, uh, that student would be subject to um, disciplinary action. If it is an adult at a school-sponsored event that's off-grounds, we don't have jurisdiction there. John? So how do we monitor this if it's not, uh, if it's a, a school function with, you know, a basketball game or a swim meet and they're out in the courtyard, the adults are smoking? Who is going to monitor that? It typically will be whatever administrator who is overseeing. Uh, it would be the police department. Um, it would be me on occasion. I'll give you an example. Uh, last spring I was going to Charles Wright and I had a grandfather that was sitting in the island in the parking lot waiting for their grandchild to come out and had lit up a cigarette and I went over and politely asked him to put it out because it was on school grounds and he complied. So we tend to have a lot of compliance with this, um, John. It's a good question. I would say if there is one thing that is becoming increasingly challenging, and you know this from last year, is the vaping. Because the vaping is much more um, kind of behind the scenes and doesn't create an obvious smell. Much easier to vape than to smoke. Now, will we post signs on the exterior of, the, of our buildings? Or are we just going to leave it and assume that people know or we're going to put something on our website because um, we do have a lot of violations, mm -hmm. um, and you know it's going to take a while. But if we're looking for a smoke-free environment, um, you know, are we going to notify on our buildings that before you know they have to mm -hmm. rather than throw the butt against the school and right. walk in that kind of thing. Right. Yeah, we can certainly publicize this, certainly through the website. Um, I'm thinking immediately Blue Eagle Productions as well. Get a couple of public service announcements out there. Um, I'd have to look at uh, the signage, what we have out at Caton Field right now. I'm not sure what we have, but okay. um, certainly signage is certainly an op opportunity as well. Right. Just <coughs> curious. Okay. Anyone else for discussion? Okay. So let's vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Good. Motion 6A passes. Okay, tonight we have our 2017-2018 student achievement presentation by our assistant superintendent, Sally DeStoli. Sally? So good evening, everybody. <clears throat> so somebody gave me a piece of advice when they saw the PowerPoint and said, bring, bring a bottle of water, you might need it. So, yeah. <laughs> so um, 
I'm happy to be here with everybody this evening. Um, I left you a, a new hard copy in front of your um, chairs today because based upon a few questions over the weekend, I've uh, modified a few slides. Um, so I wanted to give you a, an updated version. So tonight we'll be looking at the overview of the 2017-2018 student achievement data. Um, uh, focus primarily on state and or national standardized assessments. We'll also take a look at a few other uh, district snapshots of data um, related to both demographics and state accountability measures. So here's an overview of tonight's presentation. We're going to start big picture and look at the core values. Um, we're then going to narrow down and look at smarter balanced assessments, both in English and language arts. We'll also be looking a little bit more this year at some growth data, and I'll explain that tonight. Um, we'll then look at some SAT, uh, UConn Early College Experience Data, or ECE, um, Advanced Placement, commonly known as AP, and uh, big picture, where do we go next? So just as a snapshot um, from last June um, of our total enrollment and some um, different subgroups, you'll see that we have 25% uh, free and reduced uh, meals and 14% uh, of our population is special education. And did you know we had 19 students identified as homeless in our district last year? So, don't you love this graphic? Mm -hmm. um, so I want to remind you that when we're looking at district success, we need to consider multiple snapshots or photo album of pictures. So tonight I'll be sharing a lot of different snapshots through graphs and charts of student performance, but these are really only a few snapshots of how we can truly measure the success of our students. Last year, the Board of Education approved a new strategic plan. Uh, this graphic is a summary of the core values of different stakeholders, including students, community partners, educators, and family partners. So as a district, we believe and we greatly value being inclusive, inclusive practices. Educating the students and families to be committed in lifelong learning. Um, we encourage and help students to use their knowledge and skills in situations outside the walls of the school not simply just to get a good grade on a quiz. And we're looking towards a personalized learning approach, looking how to personalize our approach for students and families. So I also want to share that while test scores are important, I can tell you that our assessment scores that I'll be sharing tonight do not come close measuring these four main core values of Weathersfield Public Schools. And that's why we talk about multiple snapshots of success. However, tonight's presentation is part of goal number one that is focused on student achievement. Tonight's data represents high stakes test testing data from state and national level that measures academic success as defined by the federal Every Student Succeeds Act. You will see that goal one on student achievement does in fact include academic success. We value that and that's important but also includes measures such as social emotional intelligence, cooperative problem solving, civic awareness and contributions, and critical thinking. And just as a reminder, the strategic plan has a second goal focused on civic and family engagement, and a third goal focused on the management operations and finances of the district. So let's start looking at the Smarter Balanced Assessment, which is measured, uh, administered annually in grades three through five in both mathematics and English, I'm sorry, three through eight, grades three through eight in mathematics and English language arts. So these next slides provide an overview of the different subcategories or claims that are measured, both on the language arts assessment, which uh, looks at reading, writing, listening, and research or inquiry, and on the mathematics assessment, which looks at these four areas. Overall, student performance on the Smarter Balanced Assessment is uh, reported in four different levels. We will be focusing primarily on level three, which is called meets the achievement standard, and level four exceeds the achievement standard, the two levels that are in the red box. So this summary chart is a high level chart looking across all grades of students that have received a score of a three or a four in both English language arts and mathematics. Um, you will see that we had a small decrease in our district um, scores. However, we're trending approximately 10% higher than the state average in both subjects. 
So the next few slides are going to focus primarily or, or just on English language arts results. So let's dive into these a little bit deeper. This is a grade level summary chart that shows the grade level comparisons from 2015 to 2018. Grade 5 and 8 had an increased number of students in the meet or exceeds category of uh, Smarter Balanced, and other grades were either statistically the same or saw a small decrease. The next six slides uh, compare the state average for the past four years to the district average. On this Grade 3 chart, uh, you will see that the state average has been really statistically flat in the last few years, while Grade 3 in Weathersfield um, saw a growth area and then has also remained um, similar in the last two years. So when looking at this data across the grades, you want to look at how the state is trending and then also how Weathersfield is trending, knowing that each of those years is a different cohort of students. So grade six, grade seven, and grade eight. So this is a new graph I want to um, kind of walk you through um, how to read this and what does this tell you. So this particular graph on this slide only shows us some state information. Um, it shows you the average state performance in the red line and the blue line is identified as a target the state has hit, um, identified as a target. So you can see where the, um, uh, we're trending as a state and then also the target. So this graph is set up to um, demonstrate how the scale scores for the different levels increase as students go up the grades. So let's first take a look at grade three. Uh, the brown area represents a level one, which includes a scale score of roughly 2100 to 2375. Level two, which is in the ye yellow area, includes a scale score of approximately 2,375 up to 2,430. Level three, the area in green is called the area that's called meet standards. And level four, the red area is the exceed standards. So the blue diamond um, is a target, and that target is linked to what we call the Next Generation Accountability Reports, um, and I'll show that to you in a minute. Uh, the red dot below, and if you take a look at grade three, you'll see the red dot that's on the verge of a level two and a level three, really between the yellow and the green bars. In grade three represents the average performance across the state in grade three. So as you look across the graph, you can see how the scale score of a level three increases as you go up the grades. Think of it as a giant ruler um, used to measure students once a year. You might, uh, like you might measure your child's height on the door uh, or on the wall in the house. So if you take a look at this graph, you'll see that state performance of fourth grade is the closest to the target set by the state. With the eighth grade achievement statewide, it's the furthest away from the target identified by the state. So this next graph shows the exact same information, the same blue line, the same red line, but now I've added a yellow dotted line. The yellow dotted line um, represents Weathersfield's performance, the average scale score in each grade. You will see that we trend above the state average and we have met or exceeded or have come really close to meeting the state targets in grades four, five, and six. So this uh, next graph shows us that our high needs population saw an increase in achievement that last year. Students in the high needs subgroup include students identified as special education, English language learners, and or students that uh, qualify for free reduced meals and students may be in one or more of those categories. So the previous slides that we've looked at really have been looking at proficiency. Um, they measure if, a certain, if students met a certain bar or a standard. So we're now going to take a look at growth data. And growth data is about uh, two or three years new and it's part of the new federal requirement. Um, so here's a couple key terms that we're going to talk about. Um, growth data is measured based upon the where the individual student started, 
Uh, it looks at their initial score on the Smarter Balanced Assessment and how many points they grew on that giant ruler the following year. So here are four things to really keep in mind. Um, we've been looking at scores that represent proficiency, whether students have met a certain bar or standard. Um, and I want to share an example of what growth looks like. So I'm going to give you a really kind of simple but maybe a little slightly artificial example. So let's pretend that the standard of achievement is that all students are five feet, five inches tall. That's our standard or our proficiency level. We would then annually measure each student's height to find out if they've met the standard or proficiency level. And every year we could report to the board the percentage of students that have met the standard or proficiency level of five feet, five inches tall. That would be proficiency data like we've just looked at. We could also look at their uh, height year over year and look for growth. So for example, they may not have met the standard of five feet, five inches, but they could have grown two inches that year. So the Smarter Balanced Assessment has identified growth targets for each grade. So let's pretend in this case that there's a growth target for two inches per year. If we looked across a large number of students, the growth rate would be the percentage of students that grew two inches regardless if they started at three feet or they started at six feet. However, if you only grow one and a half inches, you would not be included in what we call the growth rate percentage. So the growth target is calculated differently, which is the last one on the slide. Each student gets some credit towards growth. So a student that grows one inch in a year, um, instead of the two inches, would get a 50% towards their growth target. The growth target is part of the next generation accountability reports for four different indicators at the state level. And this provides a, a growth target for math, language arts, um, for all students, and then for our high need students. So last year, um, during a presentation, we looked at this uh, accountability report, and these are the four areas related to growth. So what does that mean? That means that these are calculated and the scores you look at are calculated very differently. So here's four hypothetical ex examples of looking at student growth. Um, because our students um, all start from different places initially um, and grow at different rates. So we're gonna, in this hypothetical example, we're gonna um, use that the target growth is 60 points. So the blue line is the target growth of 60 scale points. So for example, if a student scored 2,000 points and their next scale score was uh, 2,060, the target would be 60 points. They'd made a 60 points difference. So for the first student, this student only grew or uh, their score was 42 points higher than the previous year. So they did not meet the target. They would count as a no in that category. However, they grew 70% of the target. 42 points out of 60 is 70% of the target. So when you look at the target achieved, they would count as a 70, they met the 70% of the target. Student two grew 60 points, met the target, but also met the growth rate. Student three in the red bar grew 66 points. They exceeded their target. Um, therefore, they would also, what the state does is a percentage of target achieved is 110%. And in the last example, this student also identified some growth. Um, their change in scores were 36 points. They didn't hit their target, so they would, count, they would not count towards that percentage, but they uh, grew 60% of the target. So when we look at the next couple slides, we will look at target achieved um, or growth rate. And so that, those are the two definitions that are very different when you look at different types of growth data. So this particular slide looks at the target, percentage of target achieved. Um, if you take a look at the state, which is uh, the red line, and Wethersfield, um, which is the blue line. So you'll see that the state saw an increase in uh, the percent of students that met that growth target. Well, we may remain statistically similar. 
These next two charts show you the two different ways to calculate growth. Uh, so this slide shows the percent of target that was achieved by students on average in English language arts. So again, counting the percentage of growth met by students across the three years. And the dark blue chart shows you the percentage of students who met growth targets. So they either met that bar, um, and for different grades and different categories, it's a different bar or different number, but they met that bar or didn't meet the bar um, would be this graph. So the importance of looking at growth data is that we want to look at um, both proficiency and growth because proficiency tells us um, if standard students have made a standard, but growth helps us look at all our different students and whether they're growing along that continuum. <coughs> With that said, it's that one year, once a year measure, and we often will look at student growth over multiple le measures, um, multiple years for students. And this graph breaks down the growth rates by school over the past three years. It shows the percentage of students meeting their respective growth targets. So we're gonna go a little bit quicker through the mathematics portion. Uh, the graphs are and charts are set up very similar um, uh, around math as if they were in language arts. So this slide shows you the percent of students have scored in the METS or exceeds category across each grade level for the last four years. And grade level charts that show you the comparison of state <coughs> average along with Weathersfield's performance for the last four years. In grades three, grades four, grades five, six, seven and grade eight. So this chart again shows just the state performance in math and you can see the target in blue and how the state trends in red. This is the same graph blown up and zoomed in a little bit uh, and Weathersfield's performance is a yellow dotted line and you'll see the grades four, five, six and eight are uh, closest to meeting the state target. And like in language arts, we again see the high needs subgroup, um, seeing some additional growth um, on last year's scores. And this, again, in both language arts and math, really, I think, is a part that really makes me smile uh, of seeing our students accelerating in their growth. So growth um, data for mathematics. Um, statistically, the state performance has not changed over the last two years. <laughs> While we decreased slightly from 69 to 67, um, our growth continues to exceed the state growth average. So these are the two new slides. Um, percentage of target that was achieved by students on average for mathematics and percentage of students who met that growth target in math. And then again, breaking down uh, growth rates by all grades um, by school. This chart shows the rank order for Weathersfield when you take all 24 towns in DERG D in respect to mathematics and English language arts uh, smarter balanced assessment scores. For example, when you sort the districts from the highest to the lowest, Weathersfield is ranked number 12 out of the 24 towns for mathematics and number 13 out of 24 towns for language arts. So we're gonna take a look at um, SAT data for our juniors. Last March was the third year the SAT was administered statewide as the standardized assessment for English language arts and mathematics. 70% of our junior class met or exceeded the Connecticut benchmarks for evidence-based reading and writing. And 39% of our junior class met or exceeded the Connecticut benchmarks for math. So in this blue chart are the Weathersfield results. On the following slide are the statewide results as a comparison. And like the other charts, um, we have uh, the state 
target is the blue diamond. Um, the red represents last year's SAT scores, and the blue square represents a scale score average from two years ago. We also look at our enrollment in ECE, or Early College Experience courses, which are an opportunity for students to take a first year UConn curriculum course um, while at high school. The next two slides show the number of students that have been enrolled to take the EC cor ECE courses last year. Um, AP, or Advanced Placement, um, also follows a curriculum that is equivalent to a first-year college course. Uh, we strive to promote both AP and ECE courses and encourage the students to take at least one of these courses while in high school. As you can see, um, even though we offer more options through UConn starting in 2013, our student participation remains strong in AP. 147 uh, different high school students took an AP exam. Last year, 213 AP exams were administered, and we saw 79% scored a three or higher on the AP exam. And as you can see, we've been generally trending upward um, in respect to the number of students taking AP exams each year. <laughs> The following two slides provide uh, the number of exams taken each year in each of the different AP courses. And we're gonna take a few more uh, slides to take a look at some district demographic data and also some other accountability measures. So this is an 11 year trend in the number of students receiving free and reduced meals in red. Special education population is in purple and our English language learners population is in green. You will see the spike in the red line that represents free and reduced meals. This spike is also seen statewide as there is now an automated process where families who qualify for Medicaid automatically now qualify for free reduced meals. They no longer have to complete that complicated federal paperwork to be involved in this program. Uh, the implementation of the one-on-one -on -one Chromebook program is so important for all these families as putting technology into the hands of our students 24-7 um, allows them to learn and practice the necessary 21st century skills important to their future career and college paths. <laughs> Chronic absenteeism results. So over the last uh, four years, we saw a very significant decrease in the number of students who were chronically absent. Um, this speaks to the work the building attendance teams have been focused on to engage students, form meaningful relationships, and get them excited about learning. So research tells us why is this important? Tells us these students now have a higher reading achievement, feel more connected to peers in schools, and are more likely to graduate from high school. So this is a great snapshot of success. For those of you that have been on the Board of Ed for over three years, um, you will remember that attendance was one of the district focuses several years ago. So this is great news to share. Um, the 2017 and 18 data has not yet to be published. So I just want to note that. And um, this morning, or this evening's presentation talked about um, PBIS and positive behavioral supports. Um, but with a focus on the tiered positive behavioral supports, we've also seen a decrease in the in-school suspensions and out-of-school suspensions district-wide when comparing 2017 to 2013. And again, 2017-18 uh, data has not been released yet. So some more good news. So how do we plan for student success? Now what? It's a lot of data, a lot of numbers, a lot of charts. Um, we start really with a district strategic plan. We start there. As I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, the first and largest goal in the strategic plan is related to student achievement. The district also has a forward thinking vision and mission statement that is aligned with the future of education. The strategic plan then drives individual school improvement plans at each school. Each school improvement plan contains goals related to academic, civic, and problem solving, or 21st century skills. 
Teachers in each building also have annual goals that are aligned to the school improvement plan and are thus, are then, they're thus aligned to the district strategic plan. Each administrator also has goals related to the strategic plan. And as I started the presentation with, most importantly, we must always use multiple measures to take many different snapshots of our district, schools, and student success. So our board has provided the vision and the foresight to value not just test scores, but to value the larger definition of student success. This is also reflected in school improvement plans through additional goals related to civic engagement and problem solving or 21st century skills. So as we look forward, I want to quickly provide an overview and highlight some of the priorities at each level. So at the elementary level, there's a strong focus on reading achievement and math achievement. This year, the primary grades are um, implementing a new phonics program, and all teachers will be learning about a new reading program, a new reading assessment that will ensure that we can provide really targeted instruction to assist students with growth in reading. The elementary teachers are also uh, implementing a new standards-based math curriculum and providing feedback, and they're also using unit-based assessments related to that curriculum. You will see that all grades in the next three slides continue to focus on science curriculum and shifting the, to the next generation of science standards. This upcoming spring, science will again be assessed with a very, very rigorous online assessment. If you haven't had a chance to take um, sample um, science assessment questions online, um, it's a great experience to do as a learner. Uh, what grades do that? Uh, five, eight, and 11. The elementary level is also implementing a social emotional learning curriculum in grades K through two with the support of psychologists, social workers, and speech pathologists and classroom teachers. At the middle school level, there's a similar focus across those, but also the secondary level is focused on supporting the new one-on-one -on -one Chromebook initiative. At the high school, all departments are working on an SAT action plan with um, and also working to support the one-on-one -on -one Chromebook initiative. There's also greater uh, focus on career explorations and the continuation of increased, uh, continuation, continuing focus on increasing the number of students in AP and ECE courses and, and other rigorous courses for all students. So I want to end this presentation with my appreciation for the educators, students, parents, and uh, community partners including the administrative team um, sitting in the audience tonight. I want to bring us back to the stakeholder values of Wethersfield Public Schools. And I'm proud to work with such a dedicated stakeholder group, um, including the members here today around the collaborative goals and the ideas found on the screen. So any questions? It's a lot of information. Any questions, Diane? Um, yeah. Going back to seven, page 17, that EL, ELA, SBAT growth rate, all grades, I, I just needed some help with that um, chart. So yeah. let me just make sure I get to the right 33 chart. 33, chart okay, 33. Okay, thank you. This one. So am I interpreting this right that um, in 2016 at Hamner, 70% of the kids in grades three through eight, or grades three through six, met the target goal, their respective growth target? Correct. And who sets that growth target? Uh, the State Department of Education. Okay. And then in 17 and 18, only 49% met the growth rate? Correct. Okay. And we're showing de decreases each year in students meeting the growth target. We are not trending in the right direction, okay. correct? We do have um, a lot of areas, we have pockets, so I kind of like to say it's like a roller coaster. We have uh, some pockets, and actually Elaine and I uh, talked about this today, that we have a lot of potential experts in this district, and one of the things that um, I would recommend is having more time, um, sub-release times for teachers to come together and collaborate, because as you look at these graphs, we have pockets of expertise, but we really need to focus back 
feedback on um, the assessment, this, how do we prepare students, the standards, the curriculum, and share across grade levels because we have that expertise in the district, but we need to have the time to um, share that expertise. Um, uh, and we've done that in the past, and we've seen some really favorable results around that. So for each of these years, what was the target that the state established? So it's the same target, and it's this target that's based upon that um, blue diamond on those color-coded <laughs> graphs. Okay. So it's the same. They um, they have set a target of uh, whatever, and so depending upon your grade and whether a student scores a one, two, or a three, or a four, um, <clears throat> there is a very complex cal calculation on how that target is determined for every single student. So a student that scores very high in a four range. Um, if they maintain a four, they can receive that target, but if they drop one point, which, I mean, we've all taken SATs, we know what our SAT score looks like, um, they will not meet that target. Even though they're, they're a very high four student, if they're scoring very high and they slip by one point, which is really statistically possible, um, that could count as not meeting target. So on chart number 42, the math scores. Uh, just tell me which one. My numbers are a little bit. It's the new 42? Chart, chart 42. It's on page 21 of the. Your 42, right this there. This one? So yeah. This, this shows that we are, for math, we are below the state target. Uh, so this. Uh, next one. Next one. Next one. Next one. The, the yellow is us. Right. Yep. So I have to get down low because I can see the screen. <laughs> oh, okay. So that's the SDA. Okay. So we're very, cl yes. Yeah, so we're, we're the yellow. Okay. Right, so we're very close in some grades. Uh, the largest uh, uh, difference between the target and our performance is seventh grade and third grade, um, but that is also similar to this, how the state is trending. You'll see the state gap in third grade is greater, um, and you know where I think we're really changing the curve is in eighth grade. Our eighth grade is very close to the target, whereas the state really is kind of trending flat. So in math, we're also experiencing issues, according to chart, page, chart 49, except in some schools, like at Webb. Correct. Again, I, I call this kind of that roller coaster. We have the expertise in the district, um, but it's we need to look across the district to bring people together to build upon that expertise. Um, the so, next chart, 50, you'll bear with me. I got a bunch of questions. That's okay. Do, can we get um, the cost per pupil of those schools in our DERG? Yeah, I think we can get those for you. Yeah, one of the things I do want to mention is that the DERG rankings are um, not really used by the State Department anymore. So they are, if I had to guess, 13 to 15 years um, past their, when they were created. So historically, maybe every nine or eight years, the state would recalculate the DERGs, which is based upon socioeconomic, um, employment, um, education, a whole bunch of different factors in a community. Um, the state is actually no longer, um, we used to be able to go onto their website and calculate and look at information based upon the DERG, and they've moved away from that. And because the DERGs are um, over 13 years old, the data is a little outdated because some towns could change in a higher DERG or a lower DERG. Um, Elaine shared with me that historically we were, we'd changed DERGs um, years back. So I only caution you, we can get that for you, Diane, I only caution you when you look at this list because it is outdated, not one way the state is recommending to look at our data anymore. And actually, if I could build on that, um, Diane, I'm sorry, uh, the Connecticut School Finance Project actually studied that and had multiple changes um, in terms of DERG with regard to socioeconomic background, so it's a good point. Thank you. But this does just show us exactly the middle of our DERG. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. So, so they are using that data? No, we have to do this manually and pull it out. But the state is using the DERG. Mm -hmm. They no longer use the DERG. I, I, we do this manually because I know the bo our, you all want to see this every year, but I caution you because the DERG is not necessarily an accurate representation of all these towns, so the, but the it's one we look at. The education no longer uses the DERG data. 
they Re no longer they correct they're not giving us ways to be able to do this um, because they don't recommend that we look at dirt comparisons um In court, in, we're also having some issues. It looks like we're having some issues just slightly on the SATs. Slightly. Targets. Yes, the SATs did not go up this year. Um, this year, uh, every um, we've already sent many teachers out for professional <laughs> development. Um, we have professional development topics coming up on our district days. And um, every department is working on an action plan. So there's a school-wide um, attention to SATs at the high school. And I know I ask this every year. The, the AP exams taken every year, do we have the, the, the enrollment, like um, in biology, we have 23 students took the, um, the exams, but do we have a breakout as to um, how many kids took the class? Yeah, I can get you the enrollment. How many kids scored a three, four, or five? Like in some of these categories, a four and five is only what's accepted at colleges. Yeah, so um, I think we've shared the, the scores across different courses, but I can reshare that and I'll get you the enrollment from last year. Okay. I didn't know if you had newer data or whatever. And, you know, again, I, especially regarding the Spanish language and cultural thing, and that, that's probably something that students probably, I mean, I've been mentioning it for since 2016. Um, I think given the budget situation that we're going to be facing, I think we have to look at the cost effectiveness of some of these things, um, especially when we're offering the ECE classes. Um, so I, I would recommend that we look at that in programs and services, because I, I, I've always questioned the number of kids that take that yeah. class and then yeah. actually take the exam. And you'll see in some of these courses, given a year with enrollment and scheduling, some of them are, don't run. So there there have been changes from year to year, but we can talk about that again. Yeah, if we haven't been updated at those, that Diane, would be, I got, be great she, she did send me the AP and the Spanish class that you referred to previously when I was, we were on student services, I believe that was not an NA on the AP. And this is a different Spanish class, but it still only has um, three kids, you know. Correct, there's two but, different Spanish classes. Yeah. And without me looking, I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so um, enrollment in AP classes and then the scores of different levels. We'll send you both those. Okay, anyone else? John? Yes, thank you. Um, you know, statistically, you know, we look at the state level, our level, and where we should be, where we were three years ago or two years ago. And I'm glad to hear that we're looking at our, our goals, district goals. But more importantly, this is one of the measurements of success. Mm -hmm. And looking at it, um, the number of students that take this exam, you know, are, is it 100% participation? Um, and I think the demographics, you know, uh, of those that are taking the exam and how they take it, uh, you know, it can really, you know, it could be one or two students or one, one or two bad exams or a bad day that can make us not make the state or get above the average. So that, you know, that's just, I think, um, you know, I think we did, they, they did well. I think that they, they, our district did well. Could it do better? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not, you know, this is only one of the measurements. And um, I think you bring up a good point, John. Um, we, every school hit over 95 participation rate, which is required for the state, um, close to 100% participation rate for every student. Um, with that said, if you're a non speaker that moves to Weathersfield from Japan um, and you haven't, you don't speak any English, you still have to take the test. If you've been in the country for two months, you still have to take the test. Um, so yes, our students um, all have um, special talents, but our all students all have different learning profiles. And that's why we want to look at growth and proficiency because we have, um, and we also have a lot of students um, move into the district. Mm -hmm. So over the last few years, we've looked at demographic data and um, how many students that are um, in the upper grades that started in the primary grades. And we have a turnover about one third of our population that is not here from our primary grades up to graduation. So we do have, um, and we see an increased enrollment, um, students coming and leaving mid-year 
Um, I've seen that year to year increase. And so all of those students are our students, whether they've been in Weathersfield for one day or for 10 years. Um, but, you know, and we educate them and th there are students. Um, but there is a story behind the data tr uh, trends. Um, and that's why we want to take a look at state average data um, and understand that we have um, different uh, learning profiles in our district, as every district does. And the other thing is I know that we look, use these as a measurement and we move on to figure out what it is our deficiencies are. And I know we as a district and the faculty and the paras are all part of that in helping those students that need additional assistance and uh, test taking. Well, definitely. It's not saying that, you know, you know, a lot of us can take a test and some kids can't. So I think that's a whole other thing that we have to look at as well. Yeah. So the well possibility said. of uh, having oral exams or, you know, exams that allow you to uh, be successful, but unfortunately there are certain restrictions that we have. So um, the next step is, was, was the administration and the faculty satisfied with the results? So I think it's always about that continuous um, learning and continuous growth model, um, as we expect with our students um, and our staff. Um, you know, are we satisfied with results? No, but can we do better? Yes, and so um, I can give you a huge list of ways that staff, faculty, or um, administration are already talking about what are we doing different, um, how can we organize, what are our priorities that you saw today, how do we keep our priorities in front of us, how do we align budget, how do we align time, looking at student growth, all of those to um, what can we do better for our students and keep them in the forefront. Thank you. Anyone else? Elaine? Um, I combed through this in detail and Sally was kind enough to meet with me because I had as many questions as Diane and I didn't think the rest of the board would want to hear all my questions. but. And she gave me an, uh, all the answers to my questions, and, and we both noticed that there were a lot of strengths and there's some weaknesses. But what really made me feel good is that we both came to the same conclusion that for our kids, grade level meetings where kids and teachers can share what they did and, and it did well mm -hmm. is, is a, a next, maybe a next step we can look at. And, um, she has already put in place an action plan at the high school to improve the SAT scores. So there's nothing being ignored. It's what I'm saying is she's being very proactive to get us back or higher than, if you want, that DERG number that just comes out. But I, I was very pleased with our meeting. And I'm not disappointed in the scores, but as in any district, there's strengths and weaknesses, and she's mm -hmm. found them. Well said. And she's looked through this immensely, and now she knew I would too, and she was ready for every question I had. And um, I'm just glad that she saw it the way I saw it. We need help to, we need a plan to address the SATs, and we need a plan to address the weaknesses that we see, or the downward trend we see in some areas. But she's on top of it, so. We can't ask for more, and I want to thank her for all that hard work. That was a lot of work to do for, just for me. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank me, but I also want to say we're all on it, right? So uh, everybody in the audience uh, and the teachers, the staff, uh, it is really driven by a lot of I different think, people. I was mm -hmm. only meeting with you. Yeah, I know. Thank you. <laughs> but that, there's something to be said for that as well. And Elaine, thank you for your comments. Uh, you know, I know being over at the high school meeting with Mr. Moore, you know, it's funny last spring we implemented and approved the strategic plan and to see it sitting on Mr. Moore's desk and see how the strategic plan is woven into the SAT plan to see how it's woven into the school improvement plan to see how it's woven into teacher SLOs and IAGDs you can see the consistency there um, the other piece that was stated earlier this evening that I think is important to remember it's the collaboration piece if I've heard from one teacher, I've heard from 100 teachers. The ability to collaborate, to talk about what is working, what's not, 
to be able to cross pollinate across schools. We know it's a challenge. We know at one point we had a tremendous amount of professional development. We know we moved the pendulum to no professional development, no out of the classroom. I think we have to start striking a balance here where we're giving teachers the opportunity. They are the experts. We lean on them very heavily for um, their expertise and we have to cross pollinate and be able to have them have those meaningful conversations. I also think it's important to remember, um, you know, with our administrative team, they dig into this data. They cannot wait to get ed site. They cannot wait for it to go live so they can start having those conversations with teachers. Um, the, the work that's been done already has been immense. There's a tremendous amount of work left to go. For me to sit here today and say that I'm completely satisfied, no big deal. No, not whatsoever. Even in 2014, 15, we had the baseline data, and then 15, 16, we had those huge areas of growth. We knew full well, you know, we got called to the state, and the governor's patting us on the back. Well, it's on newspaper. Yeah, we, we recognize we have those areas of peaks and valleys. But what I like to see tonight was I saw students with high needs making growth. I'm seeing an increase there. Typically speaking, in the past, with the Connecticut Mastery Test and the, um, the CAPT, Special ed students were exempt. They were allowed to take it off level and were largely ignored. Um, ELL students were not largely included. Everybody's included now. That's the playing field and that's what we're looking to see. So we wanna see growth across all of our students here in Weathersfield. Can I just make one more statement? Um, I have to say, get the closer the, to your oh, mic. I'm sorry. The eighth grade when we start, when I started on the board about eight years, seven, eight years ago, this is just a great advance. And those teachers have outshined. They have, uh, from what I saw when I started to where they are now, those teachers are collaborating and working well together. And they may have the time at a middle school more than an elementary. I don't know schedules so well, but that I even wrote Sally in my little notes. Great job for eighth grade. She goes, no question there. I go, no, just statement. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, I just like to make the statement that um, anytime we get test results like this, it's what we do with them that is so, so important. But I did want to, um, we, we got these earlier so we could all go through them and look at them. Um, I have to tell you what stood out um, for me and for my years in a classroom was the graph on the chronic absenteeism. Mm. I know that sounds funny, but... There is no way, if we have the best programs in the world, we have teachers out there who know everything, as they do, and administrators who are working hard. If you don't have the kids in front of you, you're really not going to get anywhere. So we have seen an amazing change in any kind of absenteeism. Yes. Um, you need those kids. We talk about you know social-emotional growth. You need them there. Well, you physically need them there, too. And... The high school with an increase is, um, or a decrease in absenteeism is fabulous because we're trying to make that high school so exciting they can't resist. And the same with all the other schools. So I thought that was a great stat. I think the other thing that really warms my heart about this is that kind of sticking power, you know, that this is the work of the attendance committees um, is still in place and they're really high monitoring students, working with families and really um, using a lot of different strategies to engage kids. And you saw their social emotional in tonight's presentation about hello mm -hmm. is part of those strategies of knowing kids, we want to see you here and good to see you today mm -hmm. and thank you for coming. Um, and this, this data really is um, quite impressive of the work done at the schools. Okay. Thank you. Any other, Kevin? I'll be brief. How does the state define uh, high needs students? High needs are students that are identified as special education. ELL or English language learners and uh, free and or reduced meals. Um, so students can be in any one of those subgroups and or multiple subgroups. And the um, ELL population that is um, obviously increasing significant, significantly. Yes. Um, it's more of a statement than a question, but we're going to continue to have to throw as many more resources towards that population uh, Correct. in the out years. Yeah, statewide. Um, <laughs> Uh, statewide, um, it's pretty, I don't remember the exact statistics, but it's pretty overwhelming uh, number of um, English language learners that will probably, I think in six, four years, it'll dub, I don't know, I can't give the wrong, right, but it is going to continue to cry, climb very steeply. Thank you. And, um, and that number um, does not include, so we have a very high success rate of exiting students based upon the state requirements of the elementary level, so they 
will come in, get some support services um, for many years, and many will el exit in the elementary level. So that does not include students that, are, that were English language learners that met a test bar set by the state, but I will tell you that they, it takes over seven years to become proficient in a language. So they've met the state's proficiency of language, mm -hmm. but in three or four years, um, they're still, so our number of um, students that are, you know, have two languages or have been L is far higher than this. But, may I say something? something? Um, but again, Sally has um, testing in place and everybody who might be considered ELL has to be tested by October 15th. So mm -hmm. those kids will be identified early in the year for help. Yes, so that's, definitely. that's another, that when you right, start the supports. assessment, assessment yeah. calendar I looked for that because that's kind of my family background not my family background so those kids are gonna like Kevin said we're gonna need more resources for them when the final testing comes through yep okay Can I ask one quick, just quick I'll be super Kelly yeah, no don't call, yeah, you're okay go ahead <laughs> Thank you so I only get to stand up here and do this I once know, a year I'm sorry I'm new. Thank I you love for data and graphs so you're speaking my language with these graphs oh see and that's numbers. good um, just one quick question since I'm kind of new to all of this so when you determine and I know that mr. Emmett was talking about professional development and how it changes year to year over the years um, <clears throat> Will you take this data and maybe you know reflect on what has changed in the past years, and then that collaboration comes in. So correct. And, you, and so, will you reevaluate the professional development of this year and basically try to reestablish kind of what works and doesn't work, or yes. how does that work? So we use a lot of different data sets. So this is our, our state assessment data, kind of more high stakes data. But we have um, ongoing assessment during the year. We have. Um, feedback from teachers, feedback from administrators. We look at different data profiles. Um, we you know, hear from teachers about, I wish I could, I wish I could, how do I? Um, and we're continually looking at pro um, professional development needs. Um, we always want, there's never enough time for that growth. There's always more to do in the time we have. So we keep our priorities in mind, our strategic plan in mind. Um, and then also look at individual uh, teachers and staff needs. So we're planning um, election day professional development for about 400 staff members, um, certified staff and paraprofessionals, and trying to work around different experts in the district to do presentations um, around um, different topics to meet our needs of not just our certified staff, but we have administrator professional development, paraprofessionals, we offer some summertime for our uh, uh, clerks, um, so it's really a theme that's ongoing and um, many times there's also topics that come up when somebody says can you help me with and there's more than people more than more people we group together so just like we're looking to personalize our learning um, for our students we also want to try and meet our teachers and our staff in different places around that learning um, it's a complex web um, and how do we best find our, our experts and we really try to train our our in-house experts. We'll send people out to become train, train the trainers and come back and train it in Wethersfield because nobody knows Wethersfield better than people that work here and how does that translate to Wethersfield um, is what we, we invest a lot in our experts. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank Great. you. Okay. We all set? Thank, thank you, you. Sally. Thank you, Sally. Thank you very much. Okay, so we'll move on in our meeting here with Board of Education meetings held, School Projects Building Committee. Mr. Emmett, no. it's yes. still there. Huh? We thought we were done. <laughs> um, at uh, this point in time, we had a very brief meeting uh, last week. We had a couple of small items to take care of. Um, at this point, I'm not anticipating having to meet again. Uh, there's still a lot of work that will be done with the closeout and the audit of the project down the road, but. Uh, for all intents and purposes, the project um, is complete from a physical standpoint. Good, very Mike, good. Mike, are you happy with the punch list you had? Remember, you kept having a punch list. And yeah, going we've. Back? We, that's a, a good question. We whittled down the the punch list to the virtually nothing. We're dealing now with um, warranty items. Um, so a roof. You know, we have had the occasional roof leak we've dealt with. We continue to deal with. Um, Heating and air conditioning, that was a topic of discussion. Um, the, there are some LG units in classrooms which are, um, we're struggling, not so much with the physical unit, it's all about the computer uh, work and they get reprogrammed and they're not efficient whatsoever. Um, the other piece that um, Sally Katz has been working uh, with the uh, contractor around the blinds, 
we're seeing a lot of our blinds in the windows not holding up to the demands. Um, so there are many that have broken and we're working on getting those replaced or repaired under warranty. Yeah. Okay. And we'll continue with our CREC Council. Ginger? Yes. Um, the Council met on September 19th. Um, it was primarily an update on the opening of the school year, which went well for the magnet schools, which now serve approximately 8,200 students. Uh, going forward, the Council has a subcommittee working on a budget sustainability resolution for presentation to the Governor, Legislature, and the State Board of Education. In essence, this resolution will attempt to focus the state government's attention on the fact that the state is not living up to its promise to fund 75% of the cost of the magnet school system. State coverage is now running at about 60%, resulting in higher tuition costs being passed down to member school districts like our own. Council leadership pointed out that this budget model is not sustainable over the long run. It is the Council's hope that by presenting a united statement to the Governor and Legislature, those entities will return budget support to the 75% level. Um, it is expected that that resolution will be reported out of the committee at the October meeting and voted on by the Council in November. And that's it. Thank you. Any questions for Ginger? My question, Mike could probably, or Sally could probably, how many kids do we have in the Magnet schools? One of your kids, do we know? Well, I love numbers. I don't remember it off the top of my head, so I'll add it to my list and I'll send it to you this uh, on Friday's packet. Okay. Number of students that go to Magnet and VOAG. Okay. Well, the VOAG isn't the correct school. Though. No, no, no it's no, different. It so just Magnets. So what, correct, we have to pay the tuition. Okay, we'll get you that information okay. so it's accurate this year. Could you give us the number that it costs us when you give us that? Is it sure. a standard number? I thought it was a standard. When I was on CREC, it was a standard number we had to pay for every CREC. We'll get that for you. Okay, thanks. Matt, you don't have that up that Where's that Matthew? <laughs> it's a safe number. <laughs> <laughs> or you could just say a lot. <laughs> okay, and then we have our Finance and Information Management Committee, which we just left. Kevin? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, uh, prior to this meeting, we met. Um, uh, Mr. Kazaka went over our uh, fiscal year 19 of where we stand. Uh, currently, we have an identified savings of $118,000 regarding benefits to um, secretary salaries. Uh, this is due to their contract ratification. Um, we've also identified exposure of $50,000 for an additional uh, bus for the Discovery Academy and an extra $33,000 in exposure regarding uh, electricity costs throughout the district, uh, with the high school being the main driver there. Um, and also regarding transportation, two items. Um, one regarding kindergarten busing. Um, we, uh, Mr. Gazaka provided us uh, kind of analysis of where our transportation needs are. Um, the majority, the vast majority of stops at our schools are for the door-to-door -door kindergarten. Um, up to 80% in some districts are the door-to-door. -door. Uh, we're going to go back to Autumn. Um, they're going to provide us with analysis of different scenarios that the board could consider uh, regarding, so we can find some uh, not only monetary savings but some efficiencies within uh, our transportation budget. And Autumn also has asked, has provided um, us with a contract for an extension. Uh, currently, they're seeking a two-year extension with a 2.5% increase um, in year one. Um, also, they had been responsive regarding uh, installing a tracking system uh, for students so that parents can be comfortable where the students are going from A to B. Um, that contract will be coming before the board in the near future for our consideration. Okay, any questions for Kevin? We'll have, I'm sorry, uh, Mrs. Granato. We'll have that uh, contract proposal in your Friday update, so you can have a look at that. And just for year two, um, year one with the extension is two and a half percent increase. Oh, the second year is zero percent increase. Okay. All right. We have just one um, meeting scheduled: facilities and maintenance committee on October fourth. And that's not the Collier and McBroom, right? That's um, the that's facilities correct. meeting. Yes. Okay. Yep. All right. Is there any unfinished business? Okay. 
All right, anyone wishing to make a public comment, please come on up to the podium and state your name and address, and may I remind you that we have a five minute limit. No one? Okay, are there any board comments? Okay, John? Thank you, Bobby. Um, yeah, I have a few comments I'd like to make. Uh, just echoing the last meeting with Ginger indicating about the uh, school updates. I too enjoy reading the updates. It's almost like uh, Weather Seal's got talent. We only, our new show <laughs> that uh, recently they crowned a winner. So um, this is a winner and it helps us as a board to see what goes on uh, in the schools because we were selective, selectively don't get into them when we want to. So um, keep it up. I love it. It's great to read. I just have a few questions and maybe, you know, in the Friday update. Um, do the parents receive this report as well? That I, I would just, you know, do they receive some type of an update of this nature? Whether it be, you know, uh, I don't know if they get emails or how it's done through the PTO. But I think something like this, you know, is a snapshot for us as a board, but I wonder if the parents receive the same information. That would be, you know, another job for the principal of the school or whoever has to do it. Mm -hmm. So, but we, I thank you. I know it's not easy to keep it going. The month is already up and that is, uh, you know, amazing. That's one, uh, so Weathershield's got talent. You can tell, just keep it going. Um, I just want to thank Sue Zapla. Uh, she is, uh, uh, going to be departing as the Silasting principal, and personally want to thank her for her service and uh, helping student achievement. And I wish her well in her new adventure. So I think that's. Uh, also want to welcome the new staff members that we've got on staff over the last month, and uh, hope they will enjoy the uh, adventure that they're going to be on, working in Weathersfield. So that's it. Thank you, John. Anyone else? Diane? I'd also like to um, echo um, about Sue Zapla. Um, I think that she came in and completely turned around the Silas Dean Middle School. Mm -hmm. um, that middle school was suffering um, prior to her, her getting there and turning Thank that you. around. And I'm glad to see that it's, it's back on track. There was a time when the kids referred to that as the lost years. So um, there's a lot of excitement at that school, and um, I think we're seeing some of the results mm -hmm. of the changes mm -hmm. there. Yeah, I mm -hmm. agree. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I'll get to you. Hold on. You're at the end. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I do have um, quite a few closing comments tonight because, as uh, Elaine says, I'm all over town. So I was just going to uh, tell a few of these. On Thursday, September 13th, um, I attended the Keenan Kids Coalition for after school enrichment programs for our students in grades K through 8th. And you're going to love these numbers. So far in the after school program, there are 816 enrollments. The Keen Foundation has generously contributed so that no class costs more than $10 per week. Some of the new programs include woodworking, sports of all sorts, magical math, which was brought to the attention of the group by our curriculum specialist, and 14 teachers are participating in these after-school classes. My favorite, and uh, John Morris, I think you're going to like this, is a cooking class, Farm to Table where the food is grown by the kids in a garden, and then they use to create a meal in an after-school program. Um, the food bank also gets contributions from our school gardens. So scholarships for all these programs are available. Social and youth services also provided seven days of backpack summer lunches and will continue to provide weekend lunches during the school year for our students in need. The money was provided by the mayor's ball, which raised $30,000. Social and youth services are involved with the Keene Foundation in our middle school after school programs, which include intramurals, Minecraft, tutoring, and baking. They would like to see more students sign up for that. 
and the library is also connecting with our kids. They're celebrating 235 years in Wethersfield with a program, 1,000 books before kindergarten. We love that. Please check with the library for more info on our literacy programs and on their 235th year birthday party. I also attended the Hunger Action Meeting on September 14th. There was much discussion of the incredible generosity of our town, and that team there is so very thankful. The Dazzling Dozen Initiative has begun, where an organization picks a month of the year to bring in healthy food items and monetary contributions to support the Wethersfield Food Bank. The Wethersfield School System will be taking the month of November. Our students will be part of defeating food insecurity in our community, a great lesson for them on supporting and caring for others. And last night, Michael and I attended our high school business academy board meeting. We've been looking for a new name. Um, this is a great group of citizen volunteers working to introduce our high school students to many career choices available to them. Mark Danaher is the new career and transition coordinator, and he spoke of the scope and sequence of what he's bringing to the students. And just a little add on here, he's also working on a scope and sequence of soft skills, which we've talked so much about, which includes the interview process for these kids as they move on. Um, the group also spoke of pending industry tours, lunch and learns, mentoring, and the results of school and career surveys. And finally, the Wethersfield Education Foundation is holding their inaugural event this Thursday at the high school from 6.30 to 8.30. The focus is on the high tech skill and trades area located in the back section of the high school. Students and teachers will be showing their expertise in the automotive area, robotics, architecture, engineering, TV production, and much more. Please join us if you can for this event. So I stopped after all that. That's, not Bobby. A, that's a short week. <laughs> it was. Bobby, who's Mark Danaher located where? He's at the high school. He's at, located at but the he's high school. But he's a career coordinator okay. and the transi transition guidance council. I just have a. Okay. So talk about John. TV. Just, yeah, talk about TV productions. For those of you that were able to go into Old Weathersfield this past weekend, they were filming a Hallmark TV show, which will air on November 19th. And they converted the Keeney Center over into a library. Which it was when we were kids. Mm -hmm. And it was, it, turned, it was a school as well. But the library first. By kindergarten. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then they did the Silas Robbins house. So it was really exciting to know that we're going to be on the Hallmark station. We'll have a Hallmark party. <laughs> Channel. Okay, Eden, any comments on life at the high school? Yes, thank you. So I wanted to talk again about the cell phone policy, which I know my classmates are going to be really annoyed with me for, but it's not being as enforced as it was the first couple weeks. I've been noticing the increase of um, phone usage in classrooms which is really irritating for me because I can't focus if I can hear someone's music from like three seats away. It's been an issue and I could tell teachers are starting to get very frustrated with it. Um, this morning I was actually supposed to be taking a statistics test and students were on their phones, which is incredibly irritating and distracting. So I wanted to bring that to our attention. And I know by enforcing this policy, it will also help increase test scores in things that Ms. Desali was talking about. So I just wanted to bring that to the board's attention. Thank you, because we are working on that. Excellent. Chris, you listening? I didn't pay her to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, well, at this time, I'd like uh, to make a motion to move to executive session for the purpose of a discussion of an employee contract negotiations. Is second. there a second? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, well that concludes the public part of our board meeting. Thank you all for coming and good night.